Hi everyone and welcome, this is The Apostate Prophet, and today we are going through all the scientific mistakes of the Quran. The Quran is considered the absolute, unchanged, direct, and perfect word of Allah, with no human intervention. When the Quran says, for example, it is he who spread the earth and placed therein firmly set mountains, then it is Allah who is saying this, and Allah speaks of himself in third person. In very rare cases, the Quran quotes people or gives people an example of how to pray. In any case, it is Allah's word, which is why Muslims say Allah says when they quote the Quran. Therefore, any error in the Quran, any false statement, is Allah's error. Since Allah is the Almighty, all-knowing God, if there is an error, this means the book is not of such divine origin and is false. In fact, the Quran itself acknowledges that. This is a list of scientific mistakes. These might not be, in every perspective, all the mistakes. Some people might not agree with one or two of these mistakes. Others will wonder why other mistakes are left out. I try to focus only on those that are really strong mistakes. Some mistakes that are missing, because they are up to belief, interpretation, or can't be verified, are the Earth's creation in six days, single incidents where Allah punishes people with natural disasters, or the sun and moon speaking, for example. As a final note, the purpose of this list is not to shame people who believe in the Quran or specifically in these listed things. The purpose is merely to fact-check the Quran and to question it. Oh yeah, don't forget to subscribe because I will also publish all factual and historical mistakes and extensively explain all these mistakes in dedicated videos. Now, without further ado, let's start lightly. Number 60. Stars are an adornment. The Quran makes the identification of stars very simple and says that stars in the sky are an adornment, lamps, lights, little shiny objects. We know that stars are huge, gigantic objects of plasma that form by clouds of dust and gas collapsing, resulting in gravity and holding more and more heat together, which forms stars that are luminous and hot. Pieces around the star's gravity orbit and form planets, like the Earth. Our sun is a star, like millions that we see in the sky. But the Quran never gets more accurate than adornments, lamps and lights only less accurate. Number 59. Stars are missiles. The Quran describes some of these stars as missiles for protection thrown at rebellious devils, so they don't listen to the high assembly of angels. Apparently, Muhammad believed that there were devils above who would try to snatch secret knowledge from the heavens above and bring it to soothsayers, and these stars were made to shoot those devils and to chase them if they steal knowledge. This is silly. Stars thrown at rebellious devils is a ridiculous claim, but hadith also clarify that this refers to shooting stars. Shooting stars as we falsely call them, because that's what we thought, are not stars. They are meteoroids and are of a completely different nature, such as from comets or asteroids. They enter our atmosphere and burn and light up, looking like stars to our eyes. And if we don't know better, we might think they are stars, as Muhammad thought. All that takes place right here in the atmosphere of our planet, not far away among all those stars. Number 58. Stars are near. The Quran's author thought that stars were very close to us, right here in the heaven above us, in the nearest heaven. This is a myth about seven heavens, where the stars are in the closest heaven. Gladly, in a separate report, we are told how thick one heaven is. One heaven has the thickness of 500 years of marching marching like this, apparently. Now, the closest star to us is about 4.3 light years away, which is... Uh, just forget it. By marching speed, you would only reach a tiny fraction of that in 500 years, and this is the closest star, which means stars are not in some nearest heaven, as described by Allah. There would be so many more of those heavens until we only reach the closest star, and there are millions of stars much further away. The Quran imagines stars to be somewhere up here, and the moon in the midst of them. That's what you see when you look up to the sky at night, and you are in the desert of the 7th century. Number 57. Stars fall down. The Quran tells us that the stars will fall down before the Day of Judgment. As we understand by now, the Quran's author thought that they were little objects, lights, missiles, and they could fall down on us. Modern interpreters try to explain this verse differently, but Muslims in fact believed that the stars would fall down on the earth. 
The Quran verse says nothing else. If we look at commentators, the exegesis of Tabari mentions early reports that it means they would fall from the sky and lose their light. The exegesis of Jalalain says when they hurtle down towards the earth, the stars. Ibn Kathir says that stars will go dark and fall. And mountains will also fall down on us, by the way. Not only are stars so far away, we wouldn't be able to see them move around. For example, if a star is 4.3 light years away, we would only see a difference in that star in 4.3 years, because that's how long it takes for light to travel. The star would also travel for much longer than that, to reach us if it fell, which is an absurd word, if it traveled toward us. We would never experience it within the lifetimes of the next few thousand generations. If a star came close to us, which is probably not even possible, because it wouldn't find a straight way to us, it would burn us up and annihilate us immediately, not fall down on the street so we could kick it around and play football. Number 56, seven heavens, and number 55, seven earths. The Quran says in multiple verses that there are seven heavens or seven skies above us, proving Allah's power. This can't refer to galaxies or solar systems, of which there are billions everywhere, not above us. It can't be universes, because by Muhammad's description, one heaven is not even big enough to reach the closest star. There would be millions of those heavens in our observable universe alone. Some modern apologists claim that this refers to the layers of atmosphere, but seven would be an inaccurate number, and the Quran says that stars are in the lowest heaven, and I don't bump into stars on my way to work. In reality, the Quran references an old myth whose oldest form we find among the Sumerians, who believed there were literally seven heavens above us, in which gods resided, and seven earths below us. The Quran also speaks of seven earths, but there are no earths below us. Some thought later this refers to seven planets. But the number of planets in our system is not seven, and there are millions of planets in the universe that we can see. The Quran seems to be adopting myths from older beliefs. Number 54. Allah brings the sun from the east. The Quran makes it look like the sun was orbiting the earth and not the other way around. There is no indication in the Quran that it is the earth turning around the sun, only the opposite. According to the Quran, Abraham once told an opponent that his Lord brings the sun from the east and no one else can bring it from the west. His opponent was overwhelmed by this challenge. <laughs> In reality, no one brings the sun from anywhere. We just revolve around the sun while spinning, and therefore we see the sun appear in the east and disappear in the west. This could only be the Quran's Abraham's ignorant statement, although he is supposed to be one of Allah's favorite prophets. But it gets worse. Number 53. The sun orbits the earth. If you look at this series of verses, for example, it talks about how day and night interchange, and the sun runs towards a point, and it's not possible for the sun or the moon to reach each other, and they both float in an orbit. Doesn't this clearly sound like the Quran implies that the sun is literally up there floating in an orbit with the moon? Of course it does. Some try to rescue the Quran by saying, this is not a mistake. We have learned that the sun revolves around the galaxy, and the Quran actually means that the sun is in its own orbit. So the Quran is not entirely wrong, see? But you would only try to correct the Quran in such a poor attempt if you really wanted to keep believing that this book tells you all the truth about the world. Because what it really says is a very ignorant view of these objects, that they chase each other in an orbit, and the sun moves above us. Number 52. The moon follows the sun. In an additional verse, the Quran explicitly says that the moon follows the sun, when in reality we revolve around the sun and the moon revolves around us. Yet there is nothing here that fits the description in the Quran. When we don't know better, however, and we look at the sky in the 7th century, it might easily look like the two are following each other. That's what you would think. But it is far from reality, and reveals the Quran to be ignorant. Number 51. The sun and the moon can't overtake each other. Since the moon and the sun follow each other according to the Quran, it also says they can't overtake each other. But in reality, the sun and the moon move independently from each other, and the moon can occasionally get between the sun and us, and we call this a solar eclipse. When an eclipse happened in Muhammad's lifetime, he prayed for a long time, he was scared, and then told his people that this was a sign from Allah, that Allah does that to scare humans and that we should pray when it happens. <laughs>
Because the Quran says it can't happen, but suddenly it happens. This is still believed to be true in fundamentalist Muslim circles. Number 50. The sun and the moon will join. But the Quran teaches us that the sun and the moon will join one day, at the end of time. That's a very weird thing to say, because even if the moon was hypothetically shot out of the Earth's orbit, it would take a long time for the moon to reach the sun. The moon would probably burn and be destroyed before it could possibly collide with the sun. But even if it did, it would be to the sun like a fly colliding with us. It wouldn't be important to the sun at all. The moon would be destroyed immediately. And most importantly, we would probably not see it at all. The Quran imagines it to look like this when the sun and the moon join. Number 49. The moon will darken. The Quran also tells us that the moon will darken before it joins the sun. Someone should tell the eternal author of the Quran that the moon is already dark, by default. It only becomes bright because the sun shines on it, and the sunlight reflects off the surface of the moon, which gives us light at night. Moreover, if the moon was moving toward the sun, considering that this verse comes before the verse which says the two would join, then the moon wouldn't go dark. It would be even brighter, because its light is the sunlight, and for a while we would see that brightness slowly fading away, and it would be extremely bright before its collision. But we would never see that. The Quran is absolutely wrong. Because, number 48, the moon is a light. According to the Quran, Allah made the sun a torch and the moon a light, and the moon will go dark. The author of the Quran didn't know that the moon doesn't have its own light, that the moon is only brightened by the sun which shines on it, just like our planet Earth, which is only bright and has day when the sun shines on it. Otherwise, the Earth is dark. Likewise, the moon is by default dark. This is a disastrous error in the Quran. Number 47. The moon was split in two. And yes, the moon was split in two. This could also be included in historical mistakes. But the Quran tells us that the moon was split in two. And this was a sign of the end of time to come. Funny, it's been 1400 years and we haven't seen the end of the world yet. The moon was also never split in two. Such an event would have been seen almost in the entire known world. And yet no one ever, not even the Romans, Persians, Chinese or Indians, civilizations that were very good at writing things down, reported any such outstandingly amazing event. They all just ignored it. The moon was split in two, but they thought, who cares? The only source we have is Islam. Some Muslims even have claimed that NASA took photos of the moon and saw a rift which proves this miracle. But NASA respectfully debunked this by showing us more riles and saying that you shouldn't believe everything you read online. Number 46. The night rapidly chases the day. The Quran says that the night covers the day and the day the night, which is horribly described and we'll come to that in a second. But it further says that the night and the day chase each other rapidly. The Quran says that because that's the case in Arabia. In Iceland, you won't remotely have the same thing. It will look like the night really takes its time. In Tromso, Norway, the night is gone for two months. Doesn't look rapid at all. Number 45. Night and day are entities that enter each other. The Quran weirdly says that night and day are entities that go into each other, that enter each other. The night is darkness. Darkness is default because we can't see the sunlight, and we see space with our bare eyes, and we call this night. The sun, which is again running in this verse, simply appears to us when we face it and gives us sunlight, which we choose to call day. There is nothing entering each other or mixing into each other here, just the sun appearing and disappearing. Number 44. The night covers the day. Let's look at this again in another verse. Chapter 13 verse 3 tells us that the night comes and covers the day, causing the day to go away. Seriously, let's read the verse. And it is he who spread the earth, and placed therein firmly set mountains and rivers. And from all of the fruits he made therein two maids. He causes the night to cover the day. Indeed, in that are signs for a people who give thought. There is so much to say here, but we'll come to that. The Quran verse in every translation says that the night covers the day. Imagine this as a veil, the night covering the day and causing the world to go dark. 
Of course, a 7th century person in the, in the desert of Arabia would imagine it that way, but it is pretty common sense, not even common sense, it is reality, that night and day are just results of the sun's presence and absence. If we are exposed to the sun, it is bright, and we call that day. If the sun is out of sight, it becomes dark, which is the norm, because we are now without sunlight, and just face outer space directly, and we call this time night. The night is not a fascinating phenomenon, not an object, not something special, not a veil. It doesn't look like this. Number 43. Day, Night, Sun and Moon you might have noticed by now that the Quran can't properly explain day, night, sun and moon. The Quran thinks that day and sun are two separate things. It clearly says that the day reveals the brightness of the sun. When the brightness of the sun is actually what causes the day, daylight. Look at the wording. By the day, when it displays the sun, and the night, when it covers the sun. The night is an object going by the Quran, as explained in the previous point, and the night comes and makes the sun go away. And the sun just sticks around during daytime. The Quran even tells us that Allah created the day, and the night was made for rest, and that the moon and the sun were only made for calculation. Not because the sun is actually necessary in order to have that daylight that we call day. The Quran really doesn't know that day and night are consequences of the sun's absence and presence as our planet spins. Number 42. The rising place of the sun. On top of all that, another verse talks of a place where the sun rises. Yes, the Quran believes in a literal rising of the sun. See how it describes that the sun was rising on a people who had no shelter against the sun because the sun was so close, because it was the rising place. When you read the Quran through, you don't even properly pay attention to this. If you think about this verse for a second, you'll think, wait, what? But I wonder what else the sun does. Number 41. The sun has a resting place. When it doesn't help us make calculations, the sun stops and rests somewhere. The Quran tells us that the sun runs towards its stopping point, or to be linguistically more accurate, to its fixed resting place. Translators and interpreters of the Quran are so embarrassed by this, they translate this as the sun runs for a fixed term. But more honest translators tell us the truth. In fact, this is supported by an entirely authentic report by which Muhammad tells to a believer that the sun goes to rest at sunset and asks for permission to rise again. And one day, the sun will rise from the west. Narrated by Abu Dhar. The Prophet asked me at sunset, Do you know where the sun goes? I replied, Allah and his apostle know better. You should have never said that. He said, It goes till it prostrates itself underneath the throne and takes the permission to rise again. And it is permitted. And then a time will come when it will be about to prostrate itself. But its prostration will not be accepted. And it will ask permission to go on its course. But it will not be permitted. But it will be ordered to return whence it has came. And so it will rise in the west. And that is the interpretation of the statement of Allah. And the sun runs to its resting place. That is the decree of Allah, the exalted in might, the all-knowing. The sun rising from the west, as described here, is by most Muslims believed to be one of the major signs of the end of times. And this is a very serious, a very big one, a very certain one. Dear Muslim, please think about that again with a clear mind. This is in Sahih Bukhari, the most authentic source of reports, and is seen as completely authentic and similar or equal in authenticity to the Quran. And one of my favorite Quran verses that plagued me until I left Islam. Number 40. The sun sinks in a muddy spring in the west. In chapter 18, verse 86, the Quran tells us that a character named Dhulkarnain, whose identity no one can confirm, but who seems to be a ripoff of Alexander the Great, roams the earth and reaches that setting place of the sun. There, he finds it setting in a muddy spring, and he finds near that place a people with which he deals diplomatically. Now, Muslim apologists try to explain this by saying, A. This is explained from Dhulkarnain's perspective. Or B. He sees it as if it was setting in a muddy spring. But it's clear why they say that. The text doesn't contain any of that. In the text, it is Allah who clearly describes that Dhulkarnain went to the setting place and found the sun setting in a muddy spring 
Why would Allah describe it in the glorious Holy Quran with Dulkarnain's ignorant assumption? who is supposed to be his mighty guided commander, by the way, by biblical standards, a prophet. This is ignorance and superstition that Islamic scholars run away from, cover up, and desperately try to explain differently. This verse completely reveals the primitiveness of the Quran and discredits the whole religion. How you could explain this reasonably is that Muhammad and his companions didn't know about the shape of the earth and our solar system, so they thought the sun just goes up and down, and everyone in the world, no matter where you are, sees it that way at the same time. And no matter how far west you go, you just can't seem to reach the sun. But this character called Dulkarnain of course reached it, and found it setting in a muddy spring. Because that's what it looks like when you look out to the ocean at sunset, and you're an ignorant man in the 7th century. Number 39. The sun indicates shadows. What would you think if someone came and said, Isn't it amazing that shadows are not static? They move. And the sun seems to be an indicator for them. Wow. In all honesty, what would you think of that person? What if it was the Almighty Allah? Have you not considered your Lord, how he stretches out the shadow, and if he willed, he could have made it still? Then we appointed the sun as a guide to it. Then we withdraw it to ourselves gradually. Shadows are just the result of the lack of light. A shadow is darkness, the absence of light. If sunlight doesn't reach a spot, you see what we call a shadow there. What is the Quran talking about? As you might notice, the Quran again fails to establish the correlation between daylight and the sun, and just makes the sun a device that oversees things, beside its function of being a calculator, of course. Well, the Quran even says that shadows, non-objects, prostrate to Allah. The absence of light prostrates to Allah. Number 38. No North Pole and no South Pole. We can see further how the author of the Quran doesn't understand the sun and the solar system. The Quran gives people explicit time instructions based on the movement of the sun, on when to pray or when to fast. For example, establish prayer at the decline of the sun until the darkness of the night and at dawn. Or start fasting when the white thread of dawn becomes distinct from the black of the night and fast until sunset. Not only do these prayers and fastings greatly vary based on where you are, according to these Quran verses, in many parts of the world you also can't follow these instructions because these described events take a much longer time or don't occur at all for a while, which is why modern scholars came up with solutions outside of the Quran on how to fast and pray when the sun is gone for a while. Number 37. The sky has no rifts. Another sign that Allah is almighty and perfect is that the sky has no crack, no rifts. First off, what kind of evidence is that? If the sky had a crack, would that mean Allah is not perfect? We have landslides, earthquakes, hurricanes, volcanoes, sinkholes, tsunamis, meteors. Oh, excuse me, meteors are actually stars thrown at devils. The actual problem here is that the sky is not an object and can't have cracks. The sky is merely a series of layers of atmosphere, gas. We only see it like a dome. There can't be a crack in what we call the sky. A child in the 7th century would probably look up and primitively think that the sky was the ceiling, free of breaks miraculously. Number 36. The sky is a ceiling. The Quran literally tells us twice that the sky is a ceiling. Some say, well it is. I mean, meteoroids don't get through. But that's not true. Meteoroids simply catch fire when they enter our mesosphere, because there are many gases that light the meteor up through interaction. Many meteoroids do enter the atmosphere, become meteors, then land and become meteorites. The sky is not a ceiling or anything alike, not a protected canopy. Number 35. Sky with Pillars. Since the Quran thinks that the sky is this object above us, this ceiling, it also gives us another sign, which is that the sky just stands there, by itself, without pillars, or without pillars that you can see. So maybe it has no pillars, maybe it does, and we can't see them. The point is, it doesn't need pillars. Here again, the Quran clearly implies that the sky is this object that should be standing on something. The sky is the region of the atmosphere and outer space seen from the earth. 
Merriam-Webster nicely defines it as the upper atmosphere or expanse of space that constitutes an apparent great vault or arch over the earth. Especially during daylight, it looks like there is a ceiling above us, and that's what the author of the Quran thought. In reality, the earth is like a ball, and the atmosphere of the ball makes it possible for us to live and to breathe off the earth. We are standing on this ball. There is no object around or above us just gas with us. Number 34. The sky stripped away. And the Quran says the sky will be stripped away from the earth. Allah will apparently demolish the ceiling. Okay. Well, good luck with that. Number 33. The sky falls apart. The Quran tells us that if pieces of the sky fell down, the disbelievers would think these were just clouds and wouldn't be scared because they are disbelievers. The Quran thereby fortifies its ignorance and its assumption that the sky is this object of which pieces could fall apart and down on us. The Quran even repeats this narrative in form of a threat to the unbelievers. Number 32. The sky folded up. Almighty Allah, author of the Quran, even tells us that he will fold up the sky with his right hand before the day of judgment and create everything from new. The Quran assumes again that the sky was an object that could be rolled up in Allah's right hand. Number 31. The heaven and earth were joined. Some claim that in the Quran there is a miracle of accurately describing the Big Bang. This supposed miracle is found in chapter 21 verse 30. It reads, Have the unbelievers not considered that the heavens and the earth were a joint entity, and we separated them, and made from water every living thing? First off, proponents of this miracle don't understand the Big Bang, because the Big Bang is not an explosion of a mass, and this mass separating into planets. It is merely space rapidly expanding into itself, and matter developing and forming galaxies, solar systems, and objects like our Earth. I would suggest Kurzgesagt's video on this, for an easy understanding of the Big Bang. Aside from that, this Quran verse is plain wrong, and there is not even anything to argue with or to debunk here. It is just talking nonsense. The heavens are not a thing anywhere, except outer space, which is nothingness. And the earth came into existence as an object, and wasn't previously soon together with a heaven. Number 30. Earth before heavens. Usually, when talking about very ambiguous Quran verses, many believers try to desperately defend the Quran and say something like, this is only metaphorical. You're not understanding it. But what exactly does this following verse explain? It is he who created for you all of that which is on the earth. Then he directed himself to the heaven and made them seven heavens. And he is knowing of all things. The Quran tells us that Allah created the earth first before he created the heavens, in which, according to other verses, the moon, the sun, and the stars are to be found. And that can't be our atmosphere. This appears in two occasions in the Quran. He created the earth, and then he turned himself toward the heavens. In reality, the earth came into existence after outer space, and after the sun, after the galaxy, after many other stars, and after the universe that all these depend on. The Quran is clearly wrong. Number 29. Heaven was smoke. While we're here, let's also pick this sweet narrative. That the heaven was smoke. After the earth was already prepared, and that it came into existence by itself. After Allah said to the heaven, come into being willingly or by compulsion. After which the heaven and the earth said, we have come willingly. If we just skip this ridiculous conversation part, the smoke thing here is completely pointless. No such thing ever happened. The heaven is again not a thing. And there can't have been a smoke either. The heaven, which would include outer space, according to this Quran, can't be smoke when the earth is already in existence. Number 28. Mountains placed into the earth. The Quran tells us that mountains were at some point placed into the earth by Allah as pegs. He did us a great favor by just putting those huge things into our earth, so that our earth is stable, right? In reality, mountains are not specific separate objects like pegs that were placed into the ground. They are part of the ground we walk on. They are the ground. Mountains form over very long times. The earth consists of crusts, continental plates that constantly move and crush into each other, and then push under or above the other and form a mountain that can become huge over millions of years. They are still moving and evolving and may slowly disappear or become bigger. According to the Quran, these are ridiculously a bunch of pegs, like these toys. 
I wonder what they do. Number 27. Mountains prevent earthquakes. And the Quran even claims that these mountain things prevent earthquakes. That's why they are planted into the earth. Now I get it. If you honestly Google for such a claim, you only find Islamic or pro-Islamic sources. And some that claim scientists recently confirmed that mountains prevent earthquakes. Miracle alert. If we count Zakir Naik, the medical doctor, as a scientist, this is probably true. If you look for credible sources, you easily find that many mountains cause earthquakes, normally, because they are just part of the plates under us. And with movement, they can cause earthquakes. This is one of the biggest hoaxes in the Quran that many people in our time actually believe in. Number 26. Mountains will be removed. In the light of everything we just talked about, it is an extremely absurd picture that Allah would, I quote, scatter them, the mountains, as ashes, and leave the earth plain without a crookedness or any curving, or move the mountains so the earth appears plainly. This is how the Quran imagines the earth. The author of the Quran would get a very poor grade in geography at any school today, I'm sorry. Number 25. You can't pass the skies. The author of the Quran would be in shock if he saw space travel today. The Quran implies that you can't do that. You can't travel through the regions of the earth and the heavens. O tribe of genant men, if you are able to pass through the confines of heaven and earth, pass through them. You shall not pass except by authority. We have done that today. We have traveled to space, through space, sent drones, installed satellites, landed on the moon. People send GoPros. Some say the verse says you can only do it by Allah's authority, and Allah has given us the authority now, but that is a very poor defense. As we know by now, the Quran's creator thought the sky was an object, a barrier, that can't be passed. Number 24. Altitude and Chests in another such attempt, the Quran makes an analogy and says that Allah makes the unbeliever's chest narrow and tight, as if he were climbing up the sky. In reality, your chest doesn't become narrow and tight when you get to higher altitudes, like on a mountaintop near Mecca where Muhammad probably experienced this. The air just becomes thinner, which makes it harder to breathe. Number 23. Allah drives clouds. Allah drives the clouds and makes them come together, so they form masses. I know, someone will say, Allah made clouds, which means he drives clouds. But look at how the verse explains it. Do you not see that Allah drives clouds? Then he brings them together. It describes something that is happening with supernatural intervention, because the author doesn't have a natural explanation to it. He wants you to observe how Allah is doing what is happening above. The clouds form of water droplets and ice crystals that move up to the sky by completely natural means. And clouds move with the wind, entirely naturally. And Allah definitely doesn't send winds. Number 22. Allah sends winds. Well, that was unexpected. According to the Quran, Allah sends winds. Notice it doesn't say Allah made winds or makes winds. It says Allah sends winds. If we were in the 7th century in a desert and couldn't explain a sudden wind, we would probably say, oh, Allah sent that one. That was a big one. In reality, all winds are naturally explained and are in a constant cycle. They are merely results of varying temperatures changing the pressure of the atmosphere. Air travels from higher pressure to lower pressure, and we call that travel of the air wind. We can cause winds. Objects can cause winds. They are not sent from somewhere. Number 21. Winds for good tiding. If you live in the desert of the 7th century, you might appreciate every rainfall. Because it barely rains and you have drought. The Quran says that Allah sends winds as a good tiding before his blessing, which is rain. But wind doesn't necessarily come as a good tiding. People in rainy areas who experience heavy, destructive rainfall would call this anything but a good tiding or a blessing. Imagine you have severe floods and your business and your home is ruined. But Allah says this is a blessing and a good thing because desert dwellers like it. Also, wind doesn't always come before rain. It might come simultaneously or afterward. Number 20. Allah sends rain from the sky. Allah sends rain down from the sky, from the ceiling. As before, Allah made rains or makes rains could probably be acceptable, even if that is completely absurd as well. But the Quran claims that Allah sends rains, 
just like winds, and tries to explain natural occurrences in supernatural ways. In the time of the creation of the Quran, people were aware that rainwater came from the clouds above. What they weren't aware of is that the water that comes down as rain is water that we have on the ground, that evaporates through heat and gathers in clouds just to come back again. Muhammad apparently thought Allah makes those clouds of course, and sends water with them. The water comes from above. In fact, we have a series of authentic hadith. In one report, Aisha explains that whenever Muhammad saw a dark cloud and a wind, he would get sad and concerned. Muhammad then explained that he was afraid there would be punishment within the cloud or the wind. In another report, he clearly says that if we see a cloud formation in the sky, People should pray and say, I seek refuge in Allah from its evil. And we should ask Allah to send beneficial downpour through that cloud. Muhammad is clearly not aware how things work. Also, if this is Allah's blessing, then he really cares more about infidel nations than about the center of his religion. Number 19. Rainwater is pure. The Quran also says that rainwater was pure. Allah's blessing rainwater was thought to be pure at the time of Muhammad. But when it forms in the air, it interacts with carbon dioxide in the air and is contaminated with carbonic acid. In regions where there is more pollution, natural or man-made, it is much more contaminated. But even in the cleanest places, rainwater is not free from contamination and should normally be purified before you can safely drink it. It is not pure water. This is a false assertion based on the knowledge in the Quran's time and place. Number 18. Mountains of Hail Allah sends down mountains of hail and he smites therewith those he aims to smite. Hail is not only a completely natural occurrence again, most hail also doesn't harm anyone and we can be entirely safe from it in most places. It is not some divine ammunition. Of course, if you live in Arabia and you receive hail that looks like this, you might indeed believe that there is someone above who is trying to smite your ass. Number 17. Allah sends thunderbolts to smite people. Allah sends thunderbolts to smite people. I haven't heard that before, not in so many mythological beliefs long before Islam. Lightning forms within clouds by the interaction of hail and rain, transferring electrons onto each other and those electrons interacting with the electrons on the ground below. In this random occurrence, most people are safe, and nowadays we can even protect ourselves with lightning rods, which means a win for us, and there should be a loser here. Moreover, this is just a silly belief that we can see in many beliefs like Greek mythology with Zeus, or also in Norse mythology, Slavic mythology, and so much more. I'm also sure Allah uses the thunderstorm on Jupiter to smite people, or just to have fun. I would do that if I was Allah. Number 16. Allah holds birds up. How do birds fly? Do they just flap their wings and split the air in which they swim and carry their lightweight bodies through the air? Or is it magic? Correct. Allah holds them up. This entirely natural process that we can meanwhile imitate or even improve is explained by 7th century desert dwellers who created the Quran with Allah holding the birds up. Of course, you could say, well, Allah created winds, so it is technically Allah who holds up birds. But is that really a valid answer? Is that really your answer? Or is it just a way to protect belief in Allah? Number 15. Allah steers ships. What else could be driven by Allah? Ships. This could be taken as figurative, but seriously, what kind of figurative speech is that? I kind of get birds, but ships? We are probably talking about sailing ships here, and the Quran probably means that Allah sends the winds that steer the ships, and I'm really helping Allah too much here. And that means that Allah transports us from point A to point B, and when we use the sails to influence the wind and sail against the wind, then we go against Allah's wind and Allah reverse drives our ships. We make ships, we steer them. Allah is nowhere in this process. And he doesn't send winds either as established. This is very absurd. Number 14. Barriers between seas. This is a complicated topic, and some people of our time try to make miracles out of this, which is no surprise because the 21st century is full of such Quran miracle hoaxes. But I'll keep this short and simple, and definitely explain this more extensively in a dedicated video. The Quran speaks in three verses of a separation between two waters. In one verse, it mentions that Allah put a barrier between sweet and salty water. And in two other verses, it says that there is a barrier between the two seas. 
If you search for this topic on Google, almost all search results will be again about Islam and Muslims, because no one else cares. Because Muslims try to explain the assertions in these verses, because such a thing doesn't really exist. There is no place on earth where two seas don't really mix into each other. And there is no place where two waters, salty or sweet, don't mix. They only mix below the surface and can't be seen from above due to their different qualities that they transfer into each other when they mix. The Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean, for example, have different qualities based on their depth, the area, and many other factors. Which is why the qualities of the water in the Mediterranean are preserved, just as the qualities of the Atlantic Ocean. The water mixes at this point, but it merely changes the water that is transferred into the other sea. The qualities are preserved on both sides, based on entirely natural circumstances. The only thing the Quran could mean, and be kind of accurate about, is that the two seas, the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, are separated by land. Popular topic, which looks like a divine barrier. But can you really call this a barrier between two seas? Number 13. All life is in communities. Quran chapter 6 verse 38 says that all living beings are in communities like humans. This has two interpretations. One is that they all live in communities, which is outright wrong, since many animals are completely solitary and hang out by themselves for life and fight and protect territory, like most bears, especially wolverines. Some are born alone, grow up alone, live alone and die alone, like sea turtles. The second interpretation is that this means all animals have a specific kind, a set species. But this is not true either. Many animals form by evolving and becoming something different, which is completely proven. As they change and reproduce, they become groups and mix into each other or out of each other. There is absolutely no plan in this. We can even have influence on this and create them, like domesticated dogs out of wolves, of which we make breeds that can be very unique too, like our sweet labradoodle. Number 12. Everything in pairs. According to the Quran, everything comes in pairs, in mates. This is far from the truth. In reality, we have many animals that don't mate, that don't have two sexes. We have those that reproduce by themselves. We have animals with two sexes, more than two sexes, one sex, etc. The New Mexico whiptail is only female, for example, and reproduces without mating, which completely debunks the Quran's claim. Other animals don't have two sexes, or are hermaphrodites, they have all the organs. A 7th century man couldn't have known this, but we know, and we can immediately discard this assertion of the Quran as baseless and very clearly wrong. Number 11 and number 10, plants in pairs and fruits in pairs. In fact, we can go ahead and count two more mistakes and dismiss both of them with the same explanation. Neither plants nor fruits have necessarily all two mates, or a limit of two mates, and many reproduce by themselves, like dandelions, that spread asexually by seed. Fungi reproduce asexually. The statement about fruit is completely ridiculous. There is no such thing as fruit coming in pairs. There is no accurate interpretation to this. There is no A apple and B apple. There is no male apple and female apple, or male pear and female pear, or male banana and female banana. Nor is there a counterpart to apples, or a counterpart to bananas. The verse about fruit is completely wrong, ignorant, just weird. What the perfect book that was supposedly sent by the all-knowing Allah didn't know can be learned in biology classes at school. Number 9. Milk from livestock is pure and agreeable. The Quran claims that milk from livestock is pure and agreeable. If we go with cow milk, for example, most cow milk is infected with bad bacteria and needs to be pasteurized. This could be better under better circumstances for the cow, and a better environment. But even under natural circumstances, it is hard to get clean milk. So it pretty much depends on human effort and the cow to actually achieve pure milk. Allah is not telling us the whole truth here. Besides, 75% of humans are lactose intolerant, and that has been around for over 10,000 years. And if you are lactose intolerant, then you can't get around it. No matter in what condition the milk is, as pure as possible, dirty or pasteurized, it won't be entirely agreeable with your body. Some Muslim sources will tell you that you will be fine if you drink raw milk, but that is only because otherwise Allah's promise will be broken, as it is in reality. Number 8. Milk between filth and blood. 
The Quran also says that Allah gives you milk to drink from between filth and blood. Delicious, fascinating, magical. This probably sounded fascinating to early Muslims. In reality, grass is very naturally processed and turned into milk, far away from any filth. The animal simply processes useful elements of its food and turns it into milk so the animal can feed its offspring, just the way it also dissects other parts of the food and feeds its own body, just the way it turns some of it into poop, which the Quran doesn't proudly declare as a sign of Allah. Number 7. Sperm comes from between backbone and ribs. Where does sperm come from? Does it come from the belly, breasts, ears, eyes? We know it comes from testicles. But according to the Quran, it comes from between backbones and ribs. Because what the Quran says is clearly nonsense, there are some theories on what this verse could actually mean. The text says that a gushing fluid, of which man is made, sperm, comes from between backbones and al-taraibi, some interpretations played with this last word, but fundamentalists and others agree that this refers to the man's ribs. So sperm comes from between backbones and ribs, which is complete nonsense. Some modern apologists desperately try to say that this is not only accurate, but also a miracle, by claiming that the tissue that forms our testicles, which form our sperm, originates from the loins. But not only is there no such theory, that would also be a very far reach, equal to saying, I eat with my butt. Well, see, the tissues that form my mouth actually originate in the buttocks during the embryonic stage, which means I eat with my ass. Number 6. Sperm equals human. There was a time when people believed that a human's entire origin was readily available in a man's fluid, the sperm. You are here, in this sack. You go through a race with other sperm and then start forming inside your mother. Actually, many people still believe that. And the Quran tells us the same story. But this is wrong. If that was true, we could probably raise a sperm without a mother. In reality, a sperm is not really a human. A sperm out of millions goes into a mother's uterus and encounters the ovum from the mother. The two contribute half of the future human's genetics and together create a zygote in the uterus, which then becomes an embryo. If a different sperm reached the uterus, it would still be you. But the combination would bring different genetics forth, and your sex could be different. The Quran falsely states that human was created from a gushing fluid, from semen. It even says that human was that fluid, a contemptible water. Number 5. Gender after clot. In a more obvious mistake, the Quran even tries to tell us that whether we are male or female, is determined long after we become a clot. In a hadith, it becomes clearer when Muhammad explains to his believers how this process happens. The Prophet said, At every womb, Allah appoints an angel who says, O oh Lord, a drop of semen. O oh Lord, a clot. O oh Lord, a little lump of flesh. Then, if Allah wishes to complete its creation, the angel asks, Will it be a male or a female? a wretched or a blessed, and how much will his provision be, and what will his age be. So all that is written while the child is still in the mother's womb. I know, the rest of this is very ridiculous as well and makes no sense, but that is a different topic for a different day. As you can see, Muhammad clearly says that the angel asks Allah and then gives the uh, lump of flesh a sex while it is in the womb. Scientifically considered, all this is complete garbage. In reality, the sex of a person is already determined at conception because it merely depends on the chromosomes that the sperm and the egg of the mother contribute. The mother has two X chromosomes. The father has an X and a Y chromosome. If the father gives a Y, it becomes XY, a male. If the father gives an X chromosome, it becomes XX, a female. This happens the moment the egg is fertilized. This is very common and clear information. We only see the sexual features a few weeks after, and the author of the Quran thought that it magically happens through Allah and an angel. Number 4. Sperm becomes blood. According to the Quran, the sperm, we, become a clot of congealed blood. This never happens. The egg inside the mother that is fertilized with sperm forms a zygote, a cell that grows within the uterus and becomes an embryo. This is not a clot of blood. 
What some people think is that since Muhammad lived in a time where miscarriages were very frequent, and because during a miscarriage the embryo is discharged with a lot of blood, people like Muhammad erroneously thought it was a clot of blood. Apologists try to explain the Quran's false assertion and do what you shouldn't do with scripture. Try and rescue it and make it right. Number 3. Flash after bones. In another failure on biology and embryology, the Quran explains that Allah creates of sperm a clot, then a lump, then of that lump bones, then those bones are covered with flesh. This is plain wrong. Flesh or muscles don't form after bones. Flesh and the tissue for bones form simultaneously, and the bones are only finished after the flesh. The belief that flesh formed and wrapped itself around bones was widely held in Muhammad's time, because that's what you think, considering that bones hold us together, and flesh is around them. Some apologists try to correct this by saying, it says, and we covered it with flesh, not then we covered it. But that would not only make no big difference, if you read the verse, it also clearly tells the whole process, in sequences, where flesh then comes wrongly after bones. Number 2. Eight Types of Livestock In two occasions, the Quran claims Allah created eight types of livestock for humans. It goes on and counts those as sheep, goats, camels, and oxen or cows. It counts these four types as eight, including male and female. The problem is that the Quran's knowledge suffers from the geographical limits of its birthplace. People in Arabia didn't have deer as livestock, for example, while other cultures were much dependent on deer at the same time, which is a completely different animal from those counted here and doesn't fit into any category. No explanation to these Quran verses saves the Quran from being wrong due to ignorance. And finally, I never thought we would arrive here. Number 1. The Earth is Flat this is going to be long, but this is the most beautiful part of this entire collection. The flat earth. Let's read some Quran verses. Let's see how these sound. And it is he who spread the earth, and placed therein firmly set mountains and rivers. He causes the night to cover the day. And the earth, we have spread it, and cast therein firmly set mountains. He who made for you the earth a bed, and the sky a ceiling, and sent down from the sky rain. It is he who has made for you the earth as a bed, and inserted therein for you roadways, and sent down from the sky rain. And at the earth, how it is spread out, the Lord of the two easts and the two wests. He spread the earth, and Allah has made for you the earth as a carpet. Doesn't it sound a bit like the Quran imagines earth to be this bed, or this carpet, spread out and flat, above which there is a ceiling, a dome, a canopy, and Allah sends rain from that dome. What about the sun that moves around the earth? What about all the other points we have seen on this list? Today's apologists might explain all these Quran verses in some ways, and say that all the references to the earth as a flat bed or a carpet just mean to explain that the earth under our feet is flat to a human, so we can walk and build on it. But that's easy to say. The earth is flat. Oh, he just means... <laughs> flat for us to walk on, you know, like from our perspective, it looks flat to me. But early Muslims did believe that the earth was flat. A famous commentary on the Quran gives us insight on the sentiments of Islamic scholars in the 15th century and says that most scholars agree that the earth was flat, about laid out flat. This on a literal reading suggests that the earth is flat, which is the opinion of the scholars of the revealed law, and not a ball as astronomers claim, even if the latter doesn't contradict the pillars of the law. They didn't acknowledge a spherical earth and outer space and the solar system. They believed that the sky was raised above the earth, with or without invisible pillars. Although we know that this is a misconception, as the sky is not an object, but just layers of atmosphere. And the earliest Muslims believed in even crazier things, that other Muslims have meanwhile caused to be forgotten. The whale. The earliest Muslims believed that the earth was flat. The earth was built upon the back of a whale, a whale that swims on the seas. And above our earth is the ceiling that is the sky. And above that sky there are several more heavens. And above that heaven is Allah's throne, on a dome. I'm not making this up. There is a Quran verse that goes, Nun, by the pen and what they inscribe. The pen apparently refers to a pen that Allah commands to write the history and future of everything. 
Allah uses a pen for that. But the noon is nowadays claimed to be just a letter, and Allah knows the meaning. That's not what early Muslims thought. If we check the most famous and reliable commentaries, the first being Ibn Kathir, he directly quotes one of Muhammad's trusted companions, Ibn Abbas, who was very close to Muhammad, whom Muhammad directly educated on religious matters and the interpretation of the Quran, and about whom Muhammad apparently prayed to Allah and asked Allah to give him knowledge on religious matters and on the interpretation of the Quran. In an authentic narration, Ibn Abbas is quoted as saying, the first thing Allah created was the pen. He ordered it to write. It said, what shall I write? He said, write the fate. So it wrote what will happen from that day until the day of judgment. Then he created the noon, the whale. Then he raised the water and created the heaven with it and laid the earth on the back of the noon. The noon moved and so did the earth. So it was fixed down with mountains. The noon is the great whale that holds the seven earths, as the tafsir again casually points out. If we look at one of the earliest commentaries of the Quran, which Ibn Kathir quotes, the tafsir of Tabari, we see that he says that the earth was made on the back of a whale and gives us the same narrations and more narrations that the earth was made on the back of the noon. According to the same narrations, Allah also raised the water of the whale and then created the heavens with it. This corresponds with a Quran verse. Before all of that, Allah's throne was over the waters. This entire narrative about the flat earth and the whale is repeated in multiple Islamic sources, such as the tafsirs, the exegesis, the commentaries of Tabari, Qurtubi, Ibn Kathir, Jalalain, and many other scholars. Later, this story became more and more unknown and forgotten because it was awkward. It is extremely embarrassing and reveals once again the primitive and ignorant nature of the Quran. And only many centuries after Muhammad's time did scholars say that the earth might be round, later that it is likely round, then that it is almost certainly round, then that it is clearly round, and each time they claimed the Quran accurately described it, as they do today. It doesn't. The Quran says the earth is flat. The end. And these are the scientific mistakes of the Quran. If anyone, especially Muslim apologists, has any problems with any of these points, I would always appreciate responses. To everyone else, especially to Muslims, I would like to say, maybe read these verses. Think about them honestly. Think about the fact that you believe Allah gave you a brain that you should use. Allah gave me a brain. He tells me that in the Quran. He tells me to think. Can I really be blamed for questioning? for daring to think. What do you think about these Quran verses when you read them? What would anyone think without trying to make up excuses and explanations that try to save the Quran? Here we have over 60 mistakes in over a hundred Quran verses, and these make sure that this book, that is supposedly the direct unchanged word of Allah, is certainly not from an all-knowing creator of the universe, but rather from someone who lived in the 7th century and didn't know the world better than you and I do. There is no reason to believe in it. It doesn't even need to be debunked. People are trying to save it, because if you just reveal the verses of the Quran and lay them down as they are, the Quran destroys itself. I'm only here to help. Thanks for watching. And please share this everywhere so we can spread the word. If you want to help me create more and spread more knowledge, you can always consider supporting me on Patreon or on apostateprofit.com. Thank you all so much. I will be back with so much more. Have a great day and stay away from Islam.